Um, so welcome to the first part of this easy build tutorial. Um, this is the, the screen I'll mostly be, be sharing and looking at, but I'll, I'll flip things around a bit and, and make things full screen as it makes sense. Um, I hope this is big enough font wise. If not, do let me know. Um, so on the top left, I have a couple of slides which I'll use to mostly drive um, the session today. But the biggest part of the contents will be on the right in the actual tutorial uh, website. So I'll, I'll copy paste the link in the rocket chat to that as well. They're also mentioned in the slides which I've shared already in the, in the chat. Um, and I'll also have a terminal session here on, on Putty um, where I've prepared a small software stack with easy build. So if you go to the project space um, of the Lumi um, preparation project, uh, you'll see an easy build subdirectory there and we'll be using some of those installations uh, during the hands-on, but that's for later um, in the session. Um, what I'll do now is I'll, I'll start with the slides. Uh, and make that full screen actually. Like this, is this popping up full screen? Yes. Okay. So I figured it make it could make sense to do some short introductions first. Now there's a lot of people here, um, but I'm, I'm mainly interested in what kind of experience we have with easy build already since um, that will be interesting for me to know where to spend most of the time today. I'll, I'll start off myself very quickly. Um, I'm Kenneth Host. I work at Ghent University since 2010. Um, and Easy Build was thrown in my lap pretty much shortly after I started in the team. It was already there, so I didn't create um, the project. Um, and gradually we've, we've worked on it mostly for internal work. And at some point we were happy enough with it uh, to make it publicly available. Um, and since then, the community has grown around it and I've, I've become, I guess, the lead developer, community manager, release manager, all of those things combined. Um, okay, I think we got everyone. Thank you very much. That gives me a good view. So most people seem fairly new and are um, aware of the high level concepts, I think. Some have hands-on experience, some have not. Um, Okay, that's very helpful. Um, so for this tutorial, um, there's gonna be four sessions. The first one is today with the, the introduction and also a little, a little bit of hands-on already with installing, configuring and using EasyBuild. Then the second part is in two weeks. Um, it says using EasyBuild, we'll do some of that today as well. It goes beyond um, the basics a little bit. Um, so rather than just using what EasyBuild includes already, how to add support for additional software yourself, how to tweak existing things and so on. Then more advanced topics, um, think like using a custom module naming scheme, um, hooks, um, submitting installations as jobs to Slurm, things like this will be covered in the advanced topics. And then the last session, which is um, not planned yet, there's no fixed date yet for this, is EasyBuild on Cray systems. Um, and for this, I hope to work together with the people from CSCS in Switzerland, which have a lot of experience with easy build on, on Cray, mainly on their Pitts Dane system, but also on others. Um, I, I still have to reach out to them to see if they have time to help out with uh, fleshing out that part of the tutorial, since this is a, a new section. Um, but yeah, hopefully that will work out. The practical information for the tutorial, as I said, most of the contents is in the tutorial website. Uh, which is uh, parked on GitHub. Um, there's a Lumi specific version. So if you go to the tutorial, let me make this full screen. Um, you should get this view and the part you're interested in is the last part here on the right. We did this tutorial for ISC last year as well. At least that was the plan because the tutorials were postponed. Uh, but we did the tutorial anyway in an online format outside of ISC. Um, and this um, last version is a refresh of uh, those contents. So they're mostly the same, certainly for today, um, but things have been refreshed and extended a little bit and the, uh, the structure is a little bit different as well. 
Uh, and for the other parts, especially for the advanced topics and certainly for the gray um, section, um, there will be lots of new contents uh, that will be added. Um, this site is fully public, so um, anyone else can um, see the contents of the tutorial. Um, and there's an overview page here as well, which just links to the different sections together with the dates. Um, so if you, I'll, I'll use it half screen here, which gives you a hamburger menu here on the, on the left. Um, so whether you want to do half screen terminal website, that probably makes sense um, for most of the session today. For the hands-on exercises, um, we will use Putty um, at CSC. So I, I think most people have an account there um, already. If you don't, um, that's not a big problem. Um, you can certainly use your own local system as well. Um, so there's nothing really special on, on Putty um, for this tutorial, except for a small uh, prepared software stack. So with the latest FOSS 2020B uh, toolchain in EasyBuild, so there's a couple of installations there just to avoid that you have to wait for an hour um, to build GCC 10 and then a couple of things on top of that. So that's already done for you on Putty. If you have something like this um, or exactly FOSS 2020B already installed on a local system, you can use it there as well. So there's no problem. I will be driving uh, the demos on, on Putty um, since I expect most people to be using that as well. Um, one thing you will notice if you log into Putty is that there's a couple of modules that are preloaded and that give you um, a compiler and an MKL. Um, for the most part, that's not a problem, but there are um, installations where that might um, cause trouble with the installation. So some software packages, if they detect MKL, they give that preference over everything else. Um, and the tool chain we will be playing with has OpenBlast, um, so which is like the second or the third thing some software packages look at. Um, so I recommend you doing a mod module purge. So the loaded modules are, are gone and you just have an empty um, environment basically. And maybe also, but that's certainly less critical is to um, hide all the available modules on, on Putty. So we really start with a, a blank slate. The last part is, is less important. Easy build will probably not pick up those modules anyway. Um, but if there's a clash in module names, something that exactly matches what easy build would install, then you may get, may get some weird behavior. So mixing modules that were installed with different tools um, is, is never a good idea. Um, to install easy build, which we will get to um, in a bit, um, I recommend using pip3 to do the installation. So you'll, you'll be running easy build also on top of Python 3. Um, I noticed that putty is, is still sent to a seven. Um, so it also has a Python 2, but since that's a, a dead language, I don't recommend using that anymore. Easy build works fine on top of Python 2 as well. You won't notice any differences, uh, but still I recommend using Python 3. And the small software stack that's been prepared on Putty is in this um, directory. So there's a project space here um, that I uh, understand everybody in the Lumi uh, team at least has access to with an easy build subdirectory and there you'll find modules and things like that. But I'll, I'll get back to this when we um, need to pick up on those installations. For today, um, this is the high level um, timeline and we're actually already a bit behind time. I'm not sure how strictly we'll stick to this time. Um, it's flexible. Uh, if people want a break, just uh, raise, raise your hand or shout and, and we can definitely um, have a short break. That's not a big issue. The, the idea is to spend most of the time in the basic usage part doing some hands-on there. Um, but we will also take a bit of time looking at installation and different ways of installing EasyBuild and also looking at the configuration part because that's, that's definitely important. Um, and where we put the coffee break, or if we have two coffee breaks, that's fine. And hopefully at the end, there will be plenty of time for questions, um, but also feel free, to, feel free to interrupt me if there are any questions that pop up uh, during the tutorial. I'll try to keep an eye on raised hands, um, but if I don't manage to pick that up, um, please don't hesitate to speak up. Uh, we'll start with the introduction to EasyBuild. What is EasyBuild? This is just a list of the sections that are in the um, the tutorial website, and I'll actually use that as contents here. Um, 
so I'll make this website full screen. I don't have slides for these different parts because I'll, I will just be mostly repeating uh, what's already in the tutorial. Um, so if you go to the menu here, introduction to easy build, this is the whole part we will cover today. And what is easy build is the first section. Um, so that's what I'll be uh, starting with. I'll go over this fairly quickly. I don't want to lose too much time here. Um, and very short, easy build is a framework or a tool to install mostly scientific software on HPC systems. And it's a command line interface, so it's not a GUI or anything like this. Um, from a very high level, um, it's a consistent way to install scientific software on HPC systems. So you're always talking to EasyBuild and however the software is supposed to be compiled, whether it's CMake or whether it's Bazel or some uh, other unholy build tool, um, it doesn't really matter because you're always talking to EasyBuild, so you have an um, a standard way of installing um, software. And as a result of that, it's also consistent. It doesn't really matter who does the installation since EasyBuild does, does all the work um, you get consistent um, installations across the, the stack. Um, and yeah, you're talking to a uniform interface. So that saves a lot of time. It takes care of a lot of the boring work for you, like unpacking tarballs, downloading files, applying patch files. So all of that uh, grunt work you don't have to do yourself. Um, EasyBuild doesn't need any special rights um, to use it. So it doesn't uh, acquire admin privileges. It actually actively discourages you from, from running it as root. Um, and as a result, um, researchers can also use EasyBuild themselves in their, in their home directories on, on clusters. And um, we certainly see a lot of that in Ghent where people either just manage, manage their own software stack on top of what we provide centrally, or um, they actually figure out the installations themselves and then they give us an easy config file and say please install this centrally so everybody um, can use it and of course we do a review there um, but yeah they, they sometimes take some of the work away from us and over time easy build has uh, become a community project so it, uh, lots of hpc sites are collaborating on it uh, not only using it but also contributing back changes and enhancements to the tool so that's very nice um, the key features, and the main one is, of course, um, fully automatically installing scientific software, even um, when it involves interactive installation um, or configuration tools or uh, applying patch files. Um, so it does all of that by itself. Um, it also generates module files for the installations it does. And when you tell it to, it will make sure that all the required dependencies are there um, before actually installing the package you're interested in. Uh, no admin privileges, I already mentioned that. Um, it's highly configurable, so we try very hard to not have any hard-coded things in EasyBuild. Um, and whenever something is hard-coded and somebody bumps into it, we probably make it configurable as a result. Um, so you get a lot of configuration options, uh, which is a bit daunting at first, um, but it does mean it's highly flexible. Um, and there's three configuration levels. You can use configuration files, you can use environment variables, or you can use command line options. And we will look at that in detail today. Um, you can also extend the capabilities of EasyBuild through a sort of plugin system for different things, for telling it about different compilers, um, different tool chains, uh, support for other software, or even customizing what it does uh, by default. So if there's something you're not happy with and it's a very specific thing to your site or the way you install software, you can use um, hook, uh, hooks to um, customize the behavior and we will cover that in the advanced uh, part of this tutorial. Um, everything that EasyBuild does is thoroughly logged in log files, um, even to excruciating detail if you wanted to. It has a debug mode as well, which makes it a lot more verbose. Uh, but that does mean that after the fact, even weeks or months later, you can figure out what happened and also why it happened. And that may be important if problems with installations pop up later. It's also transparent. So um, you can figure out what it's going to do before it will actually do something through a, a dry run mode. And while it's running, you can actually, uh, you can also enable trace mode to get more information about what it's um, currently running. So rather than just building, it will tell you which command is running um, in which directory. It will give you a log file that you can tail uh, so you can see progress and things like that. 
Um, you can use a custom module naming scheme, which we will cover also in the advanced part, um, even hierarchical module naming schemes and what that means, I will explain them. Um, and it also integrates with various other tools um, like Slurm. So you can submit installations as jobs into a Slurm resource manager. Um, and this is often how we install software for a new cluster, for example. We just say easy build, please install everything that we've installed in the last two years. And it and submits jobs to Slurm, one job per installation. It sets dependencies between the jobs. And so over the weekend, we can populate a new cluster with uh, uh, software that was installed in the last one, two, or three years very easily. It has some support for creating container images as well, but I would say it, it's rather minimal support and it's experimental support, so we don't consider it stable yet. Uh, you can create packages like uh, RPMs for installations that were done by EasyBuild through integration with the FPM tool, which is a, a tool to create Debian files, RPMs, all of these things from existing installations. Um, and I'm definitely not covering everything here. So it also talks to, to Sorry. other tools. Sorry. Yes. Can, can, you repeat, can you repeat what is it you said is experimental and not yet fully developed support? Um, the, the support for, so EasyBuild has some support for generating um, container recipes. So a singularity file or, or a Docker file, um, which you can then use to build a container that includes the software um, that you want. And it will use EasyBuild to install that software. Um, there's some support for that, it works, um, but we're not fully happy with it and it's more as experimental. So that means if, if you try to use this, EasyBuild will tell you this is experimental and you have to tell me you're okay with using experimental features. And experimental right, means that, that we're, we're not happy with the current implementation. Um, it may change over time. So we're, we're, we're very careful with making breaking changes in EasyBuild. Um, but flagging it as experimental gives us the flexibility to change it as we see fit, since it's a, a sort of warning flag um, to people who use it. Um, and only when we consider it stable enough, uh, we will mark it as non-experimental and you will not have to use this flag anymore. There's currently not a lot of development done on this container support, um, mostly because of a lack of interest in, in the community, um, but that may change at some point. So what, what is there? should work. If it doesn't, we will probably fix it. But finding time to, ex to extend those capabilities um, is a bit of an issue. Um, I must say I have been yes. using this, uh, this container support with Singularity, and I didn't, uh, didn't find anything that won't work. So it may be experimental, but it works quite fine. OK, that's good to hear. Yeah. Um, so what is there, we properly test this and it's also tested in CI and stuff. So if we break it, we will notice before we do a new release. Uh, but there's probably aspects to it that we're not happy with. Like it's, it's I think it's only working with um, a YUM based operating system in the container image, for example, that's something we would like to change and break it open a bit, which needs a bit more work, uh, but yeah. Uh, overall, certainly with Singularity it should be working Docker is, is less mature than the singularity support. But yeah, good to hear it's working for you. Uh, just one uh, very basic question about this part before we leave it. So uh, uh, is the way that uh, that you install the software in a container and then distribute this as a container to, to the systems or you bring the container and, in, and provide access, it, access to it or the, to the software through uh, singularity based uh, an easy build based module so uh, what we do in the support we have in easy build is to easy build generates a container recipe for you so basically the script that you would use to build the container image and inside of this recipe easy build itself is used so say if you tell to easy build i want a container image for tensorflow EasyBuild will generate a recipe to install TensorFlow in the container image. It will use itself to install TensorFlow in that container image. And then either you say, I just want the recipe or I want the actual container. Um, and when EasyBuild is asked to create the container image, it just calls out to Singularity, what is it, uh, build or yeah, Singularity build, I think. Uh, yeah. And it gives it that recipe, Singularity builds the container image for you. 
Um, so it's it's basically preparing everything and just passing on um, passing it on to Singularity, which then should give you the actual container image. Yeah, this yeah. is this is well covered in, in our documentation. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's a separate section on on um, how to build container images with Easy Build, and it has I think clear examples as well on how to use it. Then. The, the main focus points of easy build. So what do we mostly pay attention to when, when developing the tool and uh, adding features to it? Um, so it, it was built from the start to install scientific software on HPC systems. Um, then of course, the first thing you, you worry about is performance. So whenever we can, we build software from source, um, unless we really don't get the option, unless the sources are not available, um, or there's a good reason not to do it. Um, the main the main reason we do this is because then we can optimize the installation for the processors on which the software will be used. So by default, EasyBuild will use the MArch native um, compiler option when using the GCC compiler, or the dash X host option when using Intel compilers and so on. So it, by default, it will build for the machine on which it, on which it is running. But you can change this. So we have a config, configuration setting to change these flags um, if that's if you want to do cross compiling or you want to compile only for AVX2, even if you're on a Skylake system, um, things like this you can control. Um, but at least by default, it will always optimize for the system it is running on. Reproducibility is, a, is important as well. Um, so whenever we do an installation with EasyBuild, we try to make sure that you can do the exact same installation again later. Um, by just redoing what you did before, even if it's months later. So there's this is reflected in, in a couple of ways. Uh, the main way is there's actually two two um, ways this is um, this is done. So we we try to take full control over the compiler tool chain. So we we don't we deliberately don't use the system compiler, uh, but we build our own usually GCC compiler, and then maybe install Intel compilers on top and then go from there. So we, we know exactly what kind of compiler we are using, which version, how it's configured, and so on. I presume that there are, it's, the, the system is not, uh, uh, is not capable of doing binary reproducible builds. It's, not, it's out of scope of, of easy build, correct? Yes, we don't go that far. Um, so with, with reproducibility, uh, I would say it's, uh, best effort reproducibility. There's there's other tools that go very, very far um, to try and reach binary reproducibility, even to the extent where they, they reset the time to January 1st, 1970, uh, because timestamps can affect um, exactly uh, what kind of binary you generate. We don't go to that um, extreme. So it's like a middle ground between uh, controlling um, the full installation process and not going to the very extreme of trying to get an exact same uh, binary. All right, thank you. Uh, so next to the compiler tool chain, so that includes compiler and libraries like MPI, BLAS, LAPAC. So all of these are installed by EasyBuild and controlled by EasyBuild, so we know what we are using. Um, in addition, all the dependencies that are specified for a particular software package um, are uh, have fixed versions. So whenever you need Python as a dependency, the recipe, the easy config file that you will use to install that software will say, I'm going, to, I want to use Python uh, 3.8.6 and this specific version. And then EasyBuild will make sure that that version is installed um, and is in place before it starts working on the software itself. There are some exceptions to um, which dependencies are installed through EasyBuild. Um, if there's good technical reasons to do so. So OpenSSL, for example, is something um, that EasyBuild is aware of. You can install OpenSSL with EasyBuild if you want to, but usually we don't um, rely on an OpenSSL that's installed with EasyBuild whenever it's needed. We, we have a kind of marker that says this software package needs OpenSSL and it's expected to be there. And EasyBuild can check if it's there, but it will not, um, at least in the easy config files we use by default, it will not try to install OpenSSL itself. That's mainly done for security reasons. So we want to make sure that you always have a secure OpenSSL um, that you're using. Other things we typically don't install or can't install are InfiniBand and GPU drivers. 
since these are closely connected to the Linux kernel. Um, so we, we only use the runtime stuff like CUDA, the CUDA runtime library that's installed with EasyBuild, but not the, the CUDA or the GPU drivers. Um, the fixed software versions we will definitely get back to in the second part of the tutorial when we start writing our own um, easy config files that will become very clear. And then community effort. This has a, this was initially not the plan uh, with EasyBuild. Even when we released it publicly, we, we never tried or wanted to build a community, but it just happened because apparently the tool was, was interesting and useful enough that people started picking up on it and even um, sending us back things, even though we were not asking for it. And over time, it has really grown into a quite big community with, with hundreds of HPC sites around the world. Um, and basically people working on it around the clock from Singapore to the US and New Zealand. Um, we have uh, people using and contributing to EasyBuild all around the world. Um, over time, we have learned that not everybody who is using EasyBuild or can contribute to EasyBuild is very familiar with Git. Um, maybe nowadays it's a bit better since it's, uh, it's been there and it's a quite standard tool for quite a while now. But certainly several years ago, many people were not familiar with Git and were wanted to contribute back, but were kind of stuck. Uh, because of that, we have GitHub integration as well, where you can straight from the EasyBuild command line make contributions without even logging into GitHub or um, clicking, clicking around in GitHub or figuring out uh, git push, git branch, all these things. Um, so you, you don't have to run any git commands or you don't have to click around in GitHub. EasyBuild does all that work for you. That's very good for contributors. It's also very good for the EasyBuild maintainers because the way that contributions are made are kind of uniform. So they they always have a certain structure to them and certain things are always okay because EasyBuild takes care of them. And that's, that's just things we don't have to have to look at. Um, things are in the right place, things have the right names. That's all done um, automatically and we don't have to worry about that. And hopefully we'll have time to uh, look at some of that <clears throat> in the advanced um, part of the tutorial as well. Then just to clarify um, what EasyBuild is not. So we, we don't try to be another build tool like CMake or Make or Bazel or any of these things. Um, it's, it's basically a wrapper around everything that's out there and whatever the, the software developers want to use um, to build their software, that's absolutely fine. EasyBuild just automates that away um, for you. So whenever software is using CMake, EasyBuild will just run CMake for you. We're also not trying to replace traditional uh, Linux package managers like, like YUM or apt or any, anything like this. You will still need to use those um, to install something that EasyBuild relies on, like Python, um, like maybe Elmod. Um, things like glibc will still come from the OS, so we, we don't install our own glibc at least not today. Um, OpenSSL drivers for InfiniBand and GPU. So, so those will still be installed mainly through the standard um, OS package manager. So you, you will still need that as well. And we're not trying to replace that. And also, at least not today, um, EasyBuild is not a magic solution to all, all your, certainly not to all your problems and even not to all your software installation problems. So you will, you will still run into um, compiler um, errors, um, if you, certainly if you try to use new compilers or if you try to use software and update it and move it to a new compiler tool chain, there, things may still be broken there. Um, the nice thing here is that since it's a collaborative effort, hopefully somebody else has already taken, um, taken care of that for you and maybe done a lot of work with patching it or figuring out the right compiler options to make it happy. Um, and if that has already happened, you will not have to worry about it. What does EasyBuild need? Um, three things, since we're very focused on HPC systems, um, to uh, use it to its full extent, you will need a Linux system. Um, so the, the core of EasyBuild and, and the Python code certainly works on Mac OS as well, but you won't get very far um, at least not with the available easy configs we have. Um, so even building GCC with easy build on Mac OS is probably not gonna work. Uh, we were not very interested in making that work um, since we have a strong focus on, on installing software for HPC systems. 
that could change over time. Um, but right now, yeah, there's, there's very little effort being spent on that. EasyBuild itself is implemented in Python, is still compatible with Python 2.7, and any Python 3 version newer than, uh, newer than or equal 3.5, it actually still works on Python 2.6 as well, uh, but it's deprecated and we, we will uh, stop supporting that at some point. Um, and of course, it's recommended to use Python 3 for running EasyBuild. Next to Linux and Python, you also need an environment modules tool. So the uh, LMOD is the certainly the most common uh, modules tool that's used nowadays. It's also used on Putty. Um, but other tickle-based implementations like the, the revamped module environment modules version 4 is also supported by EasyBuild. This is a hard requirement. EasyBuild will not work without having an environment modules um, tool. So it relies on this for um, loading dependencies um, and all of that. The development of EasyBuild is done on GitHub. Um, it's open sourced under the GPL version two license. Um, we have an organization on GitHub where there's a number of repositories. The main ones are the ones listed here. So it's broken up largely into three parts. The EasyBuild framework, which is the core of EasyBuild, um, Easy Blocks, which are Python modules, build scripts for particular software packages, and then easy config files are the recipes that specifies the versions, which tool chain to use, which dependencies, which dependency versions to use, and maybe some more things like configuration options. The easy build repository it has the, the easy build website and the documentation, and then the tutorial repository has this tutorial. There's some other um, less commonly used repositories on the side as well. Um, it's very actively developed. We merge about just short over 3,000 pull requests a year. Um, so there's a lot of stuff coming in um, every day. Um, and we try to push out regular stable versions of EasyBuild roughly about every six to eight weeks. Um, it's more leaning towards eight weeks um, recently, but um, there's certainly regular releases um, several times a year. And all of these are available on the Python package index, which is the standard um, platform for releasing Python software. Whenever we do a release, or actually also during the development, uh, we do comprehensive testing. So we have a, a quite extensive um, test suite in each of these three repositories, uh, which is run through GitHub Actions. Um, whenever pull requests come in for new easy config files, we do actual testing of that of those installations on HPC systems or on VM farms, and we report back um, on that in the pull request. EasyBuild can do that for us, so we can tell EasyBuild, please test this pull request and upload the test report back into the pull request, um, so the, the contributor knows that it worked. Um, for other people, the maintainer who will merge the pull request eventually has a, a good view on what kind of systems it works, um, and so on. And then whenever we do an EasyBuild release, we do a try to do a full regression test, which means everything we support up until that point, we reinstall. So that's typically about 10,000 installations. Um, but since we uh, are all sitting on top of large HPC clusters and EasyBuild can submit installations as jobs, um, that's not really a big issue. So we just shortly before the weekend, we push all those installations in the job queue. And with a little bit of luck um, on Monday morning, we have the full result of the regression test. So we're, we're quite serious about making sure that things that work keep working and whatever we ship um, is also working as expected. Kenneth, can I have a question? Sure. Uh, do you have also tested integration with uh, GitLab? Um, in, in what sense? Well, the, I the, mean, the, answer is, the answer is no, but <laughs> maybe you can I mean, clarify there, the question. There, there, there are some differences in how the this uh, CI pipelines works in GitLab, uh, not exactly the same, but very similar as uh, for GitHub. Uh, I'm asking before, because many centers have uh, own hosted GitLabs and uh, it might be helpful to have also integration in this direction. But I, I, I think it's, it's very similar, just some details are different, but it, Okay, if not, uh, there, then, then, yeah. then, then someone can just uh, experiment with this. Thank you. 
Yeah, we haven't looked into this, and I know SPAC relies on, on, on GitLab pipelines quite a lot, even though they're, the development is done in GitHub, um, and I'm sure they have a good reason for that. Uh, we haven't looked into this yet, so the, the, what we use GitHub Actions for is running our CI tests. So there's, there we're not really building any software. We're running checks on the easy config files, like are all dependencies available or um, are things consistent? Um, are, are there any syntax errors in the easy config files? Um, the, the functionality in the framework, like running commands, applying patch files, so we have simple tests that check for sp specific functionality. All of that is done in GitHub Actions. Whenever we want to test actual installations, we we do, do that typically on HPC systems or on uh, on yeah on your own laptop, um, and that's where we where the GitHub integration comes in. So usually we, we tell EasyBuild, pull from this pull request, do the installation, and then report back whether it worked and if it worked on what kind of system it was working. I, I will show this in detail in, in the advanced section of the tutorial, um, but that's sort of our replacement for, for GitLab pipelines. It's not fully automatic and we're actually working on making it fully automatic. So whenever a pull request is opened and the maintainer has looked at it and says, this looks okay to me, um, we, we would actually want to have bots that say, okay, I have this approved pull request. I can test this on Skylake or I can test it on ARM. I can test it on power and then have a, a better automatic workflow of that. Uh, some of it is automatic now, um, but it, usually it's humans triggering um, the tests. So Thanks. yeah, it's different from what SPAC does. Um, it's less automatic and we, we want to make it more automatic. Uh, that's one of the main things we can win a lot of maintaining our time on, um, but it, it's not there yet. Then um, the community, I don't want to spend too much time on this here, uh, but it has been growing and it's, it's still growing. Uh, we're up to a point where we do yearly easy build user meetings since 2016. Uh, the one we had this year was online, of course, no surprise. Um, it's all around the world. So this is an overview of where the easy build documentation was visited in the last year um, and how often. So the bigger uh, the circle, the more hits we get um, from that part of the world. And you can tell, yeah, it's everywhere in Europe and lots of places in the US, even down to New Zealand in Asia. Uh, so we're doing quite well. This is a, a short overview of the of a couple of sites that use it and have been using it for a long time. Um, many of these will, will be familiar, like the Swedish um, consortium or the University of Oslo and so on. Uh, but also big companies like Microsoft um, are using it internally and are, are even talking about that and making it public. If you want to get help on EasyBuild, there are several ways. So we have extensive documentation. Uh, which is parked on GitHub, but which since recently has a nice URL, docs.easybuild.io. This is quite extensive. Um, it's a bit maybe disorganized or not very well structured, and that's something we'll, we hope to work on in the coming months. We want to move um, towards the, the documentation system that we're using for the tutorial here, which is mkdocs. Um, which not only looks nicer, but it is also easier to structure. Um, and you can actually have some CI for your documentation to make sure you don't have broken links uh, and things like that. So we'll, we'll probably move to that system quite soon. Um, asking for help on GitHub makes sense, uh, especially for reporting problems and bugs, but also just for, for general questions. You can open an issue in one of the easy build repositories. Um, um, we prefer getting issues in the right place. So depending on what kind of aspect you're having trouble with, but if you're not sure what the right place is, just aim for maybe the easy build repository and maintainers can move issues um, to the right one uh, transparently. So that's not a big problem. Um, and there's a search box there on the left as well, which is quite useful. Whenever we have any problems that pop up, particularly compiler errors or any errors that, that pop up during the installation, we try to make sure we mention the full error message in the description of the issues which means if you're looking for error messages, you may uh, you have a good chance of finding a hit um, somewhere in one of the issues. So rather than saying something went wrong and I tried this and it didn't work, we, want, we try to make sure that the error message is also mentioned in the issue, which is very useful over time. 
we have an active mailing list, which you'll need to subscribe to, to post messages. Um, these days it gets about, I think, 600 messages a year. So it's relatively active, but it's, it's getting less active over time, uh, mainly because we have a Slack channel now as well, which is uh, growing and growing fast. Um, I think in the, in the last year, it almost doubled in terms of the number of people who are in the Slack. Today, we have over 400 people there. Uh, there's always somebody awake, um, which is useful for uh, a quick question or, or yeah, uh, getting some quick help. Um, you can ask an invite to join the Slack yourself via this link. Um, and we still have an IRC channel as well. That's how we started out back in 2012. Um, there's still a handful of people there. Uh, and there's also a bot there that whenever somebody asks a question in IRC, we actually also see it in Slack and we can answer them from Slack. So we, we don't actually need to be in IRC ourselves anymore. Next to this, we also have uh, conference calls every other week on Wednesdays on two different times. So uh, in the morning European time and then at 5 p.m. European time, and we switch between those to cover different time zones. Um, and th these calls are open. They typically take about one hour. Uh, we give an overview of recent developments and then open the floor for any questions or problems or thoughts related to Easy Build. And we've been doing these since November 2013. Uh, I don't think we've missed more than five over the scope uh, of the years. So that's a, it's a very nice place to just listen in or, or um, ask any questions you may have. So that was the the what is easy built part? I don't know if there's any more questions before we continue with some more specific terminology. Could you paste the uh, easy builders GitHub IO URL to the chat, please? Because easy builders that GitHub that IO just redirects to easy build that something. You want the, the GitHub organization or? No, the one that you currently have the URL open for the tutorial. The tutorial. Yeah. Okay, I think I already pasted it before. But... Then I'm blind. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, not not here in Zoom, maybe. Okay, I did paste it in the in the rocket chat. Uh, yeah, there is a special channel in the rocket chat uh, for this tutorial, and the link is also in this. The link to that rocket chat channel is. Okay, yeah, I'm retarded. Sorry, got it. That's <laughs> because you. then after the tutorial, when the Zoom chat is closed, we can still continue if needed. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or shall we continue to terminology? I guess just a short question about, let's say, the, the future of easy build and development plans and so on. Can, can you mm -hmm. say something about that? In, in, in which direction is easy build moving? Are there any sort of major philosophical changes or what's the sort of upcoming things or, or is the focus more to, you know, imp improve the features that are already there or the functionality? Uh, that's a good question. It's a bit difficult to answer that on the spot. Maybe there's, there's certainly some things that I'm, I'm personally not happy with and would like to find time on to significantly improve. Um, one thing I'm hoping to find time a lot of time for um, is the documentation, revamping the documentation a bit, cleaning it up, um, making sure we, we cover everything rather than we know of some things that are not covered or not well covered in the documentation. That's certainly something we want to fix. In terms of easy build itself and features, um, a good question. Um, there's a lot of it is, is like saying ongoing maintenance work and, and um, keeping up certainly with, with the changes in the HPC landscape in terms of platforms. So different architectures, ARM and power, uh, maybe eventually RISC-V we're a little bit worried about. One thing we're also working on, but that's a side project is the EASY project, the European Environment for Scientific Software Installations, where EASY built as one of the main components. Um, so there we're, we're trying to take sort of take easy build to the next level um, in the sense that we're not only uh, working together on a tool to facilitate the installation of software, but actually work together on the actual software stack itself. Um, and, and there we have ways, and you, you've seen the presentation, Peter, um, 
then we have ways of making sure that we take away the differences um, between HPC systems that make it hard to have a shared software stack um, and yeah, work on that. So that's, that's certainly a focus for at least some of the easy build community, not everybody. Um, other than that, I, I would like to find time for some cosmetic changes, sort of. So making the, the command line interface and the way it produces output a bit more attractive, things like colors and making it a bit more dynamic. It, it still looks like it was created in 2010, which it was. Um, so that, that could maybe be smoked up a bit. In terms of main functionality and um, whatever is needed to get software installed, I think that's mostly there. Um, there's no big holes um, in, uh, in there. Maybe the container support, if a lot of people care about that, that, that could probably use some more work um, to make it better. But we don't see a lot of uptake on that in the EasyBuild community, or at least I don't have a, a good view on that. We don't hear a lot of people complaining or asking for more features there. Um, and of course, we're always open to ideas. So if, if there's something now in easy build that you say, okay, this could be a lot better, or it's really missing this particular feature, uh, please tell us. Uh, maybe we haven't thought about it, or maybe it's something uh, that we know about, but that is not really on the top of our to-do list. Maybe it should be. Um, so any feedback there is certainly welcome. Well, one thing, uh, maybe uh, support for Bliss. Or, or change to Bliss? That was something discussed. And I mean, not, not really a framework change, but. Yeah, so the, and the tool chains part were indeed considering, I, I consider that maintenance work mm -hmm. actually, and it's not really an, an, a land, landslide shift in what we do in EasyBuild. Um, but but you are, we are actively looking at the Bliss library as a replacement for OpenBLAS, since we've seen some, some very promising performance results, especially on AMD CPU systems. Um, so the, the FOSS tool chain we have, and I'll, I'll get back to that, is, is an open source based tool chain. So GCC, OpenMPI, OpenBLAS, all these libraries. OpenBLAS works okay, but what we've seen from Bliss is uh, very promising and we may switch uh, away from OpenBLAS and into Bliss. We're, we've been in close contact with the lead developer there and there's an ongoing effort sort of working group to um, evaluate Bliss. Does it indeed perform better also on Intel systems? Um, does it pass all the tests? So if, if we build software on top of Bliss, is it actually performing better? So not just uh, micro benchmarks, but actual application benchmarks. Is it working correctly? Or are there any uh, issues that, that could block us from moving to Bliss and so on? So that's an ongoing effort. But I consider that maintenance work, not really any shocking new feature in, in easy build. Okay, if there's no more questions and there will, there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end, hopefully. Um, I want to go over some of the terminology um, we have in EasyBuild. So over the years, we've built up some vocabulary um, for specific aspects or specific parts or, of EasyBuild. And we use certain general terms like dependencies, tool chains and modules in a specific way that I just want to clarify here. Um, so to start things off, the easy build framework, which I already mentioned, um, which is uh, being developed in this um, GitHub uh, repository, um, is a collection of Python modules, which are fairly nicely organized in packages. The easy build tools package, for example, has a lot of functionality for uh, things like running bash commands uh, is here in this run module. Um, we have a file tools module for things like applying patch files or reading files, writing files, uh, all of that. Uh, so there's a lot of functionality in here, but all of this functionality is general. So there's nothing specific, or at least there's very little that's specific to particular um, software there. Uh, things like running commands, applying patch files, but not like what do I need to do to install TensorFlow? The framework doesn't know about that, but it provides all the functionality for doing that in uh, an other Python module that leverages the framework. Um, this is definitely the hardest part to get into if you want to make changes here. Uh, but I, I've heard good uh, feedback from people who are new to the tool that it's relatively 
um, with a bit of work, it's well structured and it's not that difficult to find your way around them. The, the Python code that we use here is not very, I would say advanced in terms of Python features we use. So if you're uh, familiar with other programming languages, it's probably not too much of a jump um, to uh, understand what's going on here. And I've heard people making contributions by copy pasting other code snippets and, and changing them as needed. Uh, rather than really understanding what they're doing from A to Z in Python. So uh, I consider that good feedback. Um, easy blocks are then uh, where a specific software installation procedure is implemented. Um, for example, running configure, make, make install, that's done in an easy block. Um, we have a custom easy block for installing TensorFlow, a custom easy block for installing OpenFoam. So all of these things are software specific in some sense, either very specific to a particular software package or specific to a particular installation procedure that's standard in some sense. Um, so we have generic easy blocks for things like configure make make install or C make 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 install or installing Python packages or software specific that are TensorFlow, Warf, OpenFoam, all these complex things. Complex things typically have a, a specific um, easy block. All of these easy blocks leverages, leverage the functionality provided by the framework. So in some sense, they're a plugin to the framework. They uh, leverages everything that EasyBuild uh, provides in terms of functionality and puzzle things together to get something uh, specific done. Generic easy blocks, software specific easy blocks, I already explained. Um, the exact way that an installation procedure is performed is not fully determined by the easy block. It has some parameters that it takes from an easy config file. So we call these easy config parameters, things like the version of the software or the exact, the exact list of dependencies, uh, configuration options. So these are not typically hard coded in easy blocks, but they come in um, through a parameter mechanism. And all of the easy blocks we have are in a separate repository um, on GitHub. We, we split out these repositories because they have a different rate of development. Uh, we get way more pull requests in the easy configs repository than we get in easy blocks. And framework is way more specific and maybe a bit more work to get into. So that's again, a different repository. Then a little bit more about these parameters that, that steer the actual software installation and that are um, used by the easy blocks um, to perform an installation. Um, some of these easy config parameters are mandatory. So obvious things like the software name and the software version, uh, you have to tell easy build what you want to install. Um, also which tool chain will be used, whether it's a GCC based tool chain, Intel based tool chain or gray or whatever. Um, that's also specified in the easy config file through a parameter. Um, two things we always require are the home page of the software and a short description of the software. And both of these are used um, in the module file that is generated by EasyBuild. These are the only uh, parameters that are really mandatory, which may seem a bit weird because you could say, okay, if you don't have source files, how, you can, how can you install anything? Uh, but there are situations where the source file is not really needed. So we have a way of bundling things together uh, which is just a, a very lightweight, lightweight collection of other things. And you, you end up with a module file that just loads other stuff. And in that case, you don't need the source file. And yeah, for there's corner cases or specific use cases where um, you don't need specific parameters. Of course, many of these optional parameters, these other optional parameters are very common, um, like sources or like the location where sources can be downloaded. Um, the list of dependencies and a separate list of built only dependencies, um, options for the configuration command, options for the build command, options for the install command. So these are very commonly used as well um, to have full control over the installation procedure as EasyBuild will uh, perform it. Another one is which specific easy block that should be used to do an installation. So this is optional because by default, EasyBuild will try to find an easy block for the specific software name. So if you if you say name equals TensorFlow, the first thing EasyBuild will do is look try to look for a TensorFlow easy block. If it cannot find it, 
um, or if there's there is no such easy block, then you have to tell it which easy block to use. For example, uh, well, install TensorFlow as a regular Python package that just does pip install, uh, which you typically don't want for TensorFlow, but uh, you get the idea. And we, we will see this in the exercises a little bit today as well, and certainly in the next section um, on using easy build and writing our own easy config files, this will become a lot more clear. Um, yeah, a small distinction here. There's uh, general easy config parameters like all the ones I mentioned above. Um, but for some easy blocks, additional easy config parameters can be um, can make sense as well. For example, when using the Python package easy block to install a Python package, um, you have a parameter to control whether or not it will use pip, um, whether or not it will check on some things that are specific to Python. Um, and those wouldn't make sense in other contexts. Then easy config files are basically a collection of easy config parameters that are defined. Um, so key value type of um, definitions, uh, which are collected in a simple text file. The text file is actually written in Python syntax. So you can uh, use values like Python dictionaries or lists or um, things like this that works. And to some extent you can, and we allow using, um, Python constructs as well, like list comprehensions or um, string um, um, string replacement and things like this. So it's not really a good practice to do this extensively. So, so we don't want you to do import OS and start reading environment variables or something like this in easy config files. But to some extent, it may make sense um, to do this. So we, from the start, we decided not to use uh, our own um, small domain specific language or use something like JSON or YAML, which were back in when EasyBuild was created, were not um, very popular back then yet because they all have limitations that we're not happy with. And Python syntax is, since everything else in EasyBuild is Python, it's uh, relatively easy to get into. And it gives you some flexibility that, that comes in very handy in certain situations as well. So at some point there was a plan to to move uh, move away from this and go to YAML syntax, but that that development halted because I, I don't think many people were actually convinced that it was a good way forward, um, and we don't have any real problems um, with having these easy config files in Python syntax. Um, so they define a set of easy config parameters that then steer um, the actual installation um, as it is implemented by the easy block. The file name of easy config files is um, important in some situations. So typically you have the .eb extension for easy config files, just to easily recognize them. Um, and the name of easy config files is usually something like this. So software name dash software version. Um, if there's a particular tool chain used, we add the tool chain in the uh, file name as well. And in some situations, you have an additional suffix, which we call a version suffix, and the name of the file as well. Um, it's not always needed to have this exact file name. So this is only needed when EasyBuild will actively search for easy config files itself, since it does this on a file name basis to avoid reading every possible file it runs into. And we will see that in the, in the basic usage um, today. Uh, again, easy configs are in a separate repository. And this is where we get about 2,500 pull requests a year um, for new easy config files, new software updates of existing easy config files or bug fixes in existing files. Then an, a new concept um, is easy stack files. So if you wanna, want to control a full software stack with easy build right now, we don't have a very good mechanism uh, or at least not a very uh, mature mechanism for that. Um, and this is what easy stack files will become in the future. Um, the implementation is already there, the basic implementation. It's still marked as experimental because we're, we're not happy with um, the implementation, at least in terms of what it supports. What is there works. We want to extend it and because we're not sure whether the additional features we want to implement will require us to make some breaking changes. We have marked it as experimental. Um, easy stack files, the, the best way to show this is through an example. 
So I'll jump in the documentation. So this is a particular um, example of an easy stack file um, where it says, I want to install these software packages, Bioconductor, EasyBuild itself, Gromax, OpenFOAM, and R. I want to use these tool chains for Bioconductor. And in this case, they are all the same, but they may be different, of course, for different software packages. And I want to install these versions. This is an example of an easy stack file that's already supported. We want to extend this a little bit. So for a particular version, you can say, OK, if you're installing Bioconductor um, and this particular version, we want to change this configuration option to uh, another one and you will be able to do that in an easy stack file so this will be become a single place where you describe your whole or you can describe your whole software stack and maybe you'll have multiple easy stack files for different tool chains or different software packages so you you will be able to combine this in, in all kinds of ways uh, the reason we do this is this single file will replace a long command line like this um, so you don't want to pass all the um, easy config file names all the time to the eb command. You want to have a single file where everything is listed that easy build should install. So that's, I, I didn't mention it when Peter was asking the question, but this is one of the things we are uh, actively working on to make this better and, and more capable going forward. Um, extensions are a specific term we, we didn't came, came come up with it, but we use it in a, in a specific way. Extensions are any software packages that are installed on top of something else. So common examples are Python packages. You cannot have a Python package without having Python. Um, R libraries, Perl modules, all of these things. Um, we call these extensions to have a single term to refer to all of these type of um, software packages. And we have uh, you can install extensions in two different ways, either standalone, so as a separate module. And if you load that module, you'll typically load Python or R or Perl along with it. Or we can install an extension um, together with another module. So if we install Python, uh, we also install, I forgot the exact number, but something like 40 additional Python packages from um, the PyPy um, library. And we add those into the Python installation. So we do a batteries included installation of Python. For R, that's a lot more extreme. We install um, R itself and probably close to a thousand R libraries from the CRAN um, li uh, library. And most of the easy config files we include. So we see R is just um, the base and the real value is in the actual R libraries. So we, we install lots of these together with R. And whenever a user does a module load R, they actually get a whole um, rich environment um, to play with where most of the libraries that, that they will use are just readily available as well. Um, so that's, um, that's extensions. Um, standalone or as a part of a separate um, package, like or pa separate module like Python, or you can also just have a bundle of extensions where you can only really use them if you also load something else um, with them, and that's usually done automatically. So there's actually three three ways of installing extensions. And also, this will become clear hopefully in the um, in the examples, especially in the second part. And using EasyBuild will uh, will work with um, a small software package, and then adding a Python. Python bindings on top of that, we will do that separate or as a part of the installation, we'll play with that a little bit. Is that also useful for Julia? Eventually, yes. So, so Julia also has the concept of, of packages um, and there we will use the same mechanism of, of having extensions. We don't have very good support for Julia yet today um, because we're one of the issues there is we're, we're not happy that, that Julia tries to control the whole um, software stack. So it, it, it installs its own version of a blast library and all these things. Um, and we want to we want to peel that apart a bit and be a bit more in control. We, we've been in touch with some of the Julia developers over that. We need to pick up that, that discussion again and see uh, what makes sense for us to control and what they really need or want to have control over um, and, and find a good middle ground of that. And then on top of that, we'll, we'll look into adding support for installing Julia packages as extensions, which is apparently also not that trivial 
because they don't have a very good way uh, of doing that in the way we are used to with uh, with Python R and, and Perl. So that's an that's an ongoing discussion. But yeah, the concept may also make sense there, um, and also for other lang languages um, like OCaml. And there's there's other examples where we have um, support for installing ext extensions. Dependencies probably don't have to explain to you what dependencies are, but just the, the way we usually treat them in, in easy build is um, is like this. So of course the dependency is any software that is required by something else or that can enhance um, other software. Um, from a technical point of view, I think there's, there's three different types of dependency. There's a build dependency. So something like CMake, which you only need when building and installing a software package. A runtime dependency, so something that you need when you want to use software. So if you want to run a Python package, you need Python. So that's a runtime dependency. And there's also an, another type of dependency, a link time dependency, which strictly speaking, you only need when linking the software. So that's part of the installation procedure. Um, but depending on how it's linked, it may not be needed at runtime anymore. Um, at least the, the module for it may not have to be loaded at, at runtime when you want to use the software. Um, one example here is OpenBlast. If you do a static link of OpenBlast, then okay, you don't need it at runtime anymore because it's included in the binary. Or if you do an RPOT um, link to OpenBlast, then the binary knows where to find the library and you don't need to load the module um, to have it available at runtime anymore. So that distinction right now is not really made in easy build. So runtime and link time dependencies are thrown in one to, into one big bag. Uh, but that's something that may, that may change. So we're starting to pay more attention to that. Um, we have very good support for our part linking now, which is something we're using in the Easy project. And eventually, so this is one of the things that I, I could see change in Easy Build 5 that we start making this split between runtime and link time dependencies. Um, then tool chains, what we refer to as a tool chain is usually a set of compilers, typically C, C++, and Fortran, sometimes also CUDA for GPU software, um, together with additional libraries, common things in HPC for MPI, BLAST, LAPAC, FFT, um, are usually included in a tool chain. Um, whenever we refer to a full tool chain, it means we have both compilers and all of these, MPI, BLAST, LAPAC, and FFTW. That's what we call a full tool chain. Um, a sub tool chain is only a subset of that. For example, only compilers or only compilers and MPI is a, a, a sub tool chain. And then there's a special case of a tool chain, which we call, we now call the system tool chain. This used to be called the dummy tool chain. Um, so whenever you see an easy config file that says, I want to use the system tool chain to install this, um, then you're basically using whatever is provided by the operating system. Um, we try to minimize the usage of this because that means we're um, at the mercy of the operating system. We could be using GCC 4, uh, which is still the default, 4.8 in CentOS 7, while in, in RHEL 8, for example, it, it's a, a significantly more recent version. And we don't have control over what's being used. And that, that means um, the installation uh, may be less robust, may be less reproducible, because it really depends on what system you're using it, um, whether it will work or not. So we try to minimize this. We typically only use it in two cases to um, start building a compiler tool chain ourselves. So whenever we build GCC, we do that with the system compiler. But when once we have our own GCC compiler from that point on, we use our GCC. Um, and of course, whenever we install binary software or things that are just a tarball that you want back, um, then you don't need um, a specific tool chain for that. You can just use the system tool chain because you're, you won't actually be using any compiler or any uh, libraries that come from the OS that could affect the installation. And then we also have common tool chains. So these are, this is a concept that we came up with several years ago to try and focus the effort a bit um, in the EasyBuild community. We have support for lots of different tool chains, um, I think about 30 or something. So different combinations of compiler, different compilers, GCC, Intel, PGI, 
Um, there's even minimal support for IBM compilers and, and things like this. And then different MPI libraries. So there, again, you have a fork of three or four different MPI libraries. Combine this with different um, BLAS and LAPAC libraries like OpenBLAS. But at some point, we also ha had Atlas. Uh, we now have Bliss, uh, we have Intel and KL, and you can combine all of these, of course, into different combinations, which give you different tool chains. Um, to focus that effort a bit, we have two main tool chains, which we call the common tool chains. One of them is the FOSS tool chain, which is everything open source. Currently, that's GCC, OpenMPI, OpenBLAS, Scala Pack, and F50W, and the OpenBLAS one is, is under discussion. We named it FOSS to have a neutral name. Um, so not a combination of uh, the software packages that it currently consists of, because we knew at some point we may have to reconsider OpenMPI or OpenBLAS and replace it by something else. So even if we move from OpenBLAS to Bliss, we're going to keep the FOSS name. Um, and based on the version, it will just be a different combination of uh, components. The Intel toolchain, no surprise, is a combination of Intel compilers, Intel MPI, and Intel MKL. And also with the one API new generation, uh, we're probably going to stick to Intel um, as a tool chain name. So from 2021 versions onwards, it's going to be the one API uh, version of the Intel tools. And roughly every six months, we do an update of these common tool chains. And then modules. So modules is a very overloaded term, but usually when we say modules, we refer to environment modules. So the files that you get alongside an installation to activate them in your environment. Um, Easy Build supports both Tickle and Lua. By default, it uses Lua. You can tell it to use Tickle if that's what you prefer. Um, and of course, you'll need a modules tool when using Easy Build. By default, it will use LMOD. Um, which supports Lua syntax and module files, but it also supports the Tickle-based environment modules implementation. Uh, you'll have to tell it to use that instead. And then, of course, you will also have to tell it to use Tickle syntax. EasyBuild will automatically generate modules for you um, for every installation it does. And then by loading that module, uh, you can activate it in your environment and start using it. So. When we just say module, it usually refers to an environment module. When we say Python module, it could be a part of easy build uh, that implements a specific functionality. And then here to bring it all together, so this collects all the terms in, in a couple of paragraphs. So we use the easy build framework to leverage easy blocks to automate the installation of software, which may include additional extensions for installing the software using a compiler tool chain. The easy config file specifies which tool chain to use, which dependencies to use through easy config parameters. Um, whatever is specified, easy build will make sure that the build and run, runtime dependencies are in place and will automatically generate modules, environment modules for us. And the new feature, easy stack files, you can use these to uh, define a software stack that should be installed by easy build. So that's. Um, Everything in terms of terminology, I hope that's a bit clear. I don't know if there's any questions on this before we continue. Um, I'll now look at the installation and configuration parts. Um, there's several options for installing EasyBuild. Um, I'll try to quickly show all of them, but the recommended way for the hands-on is here shown in the slides, which is method two and uh, on the tutorial website. So it's a it's sort of a bootstrap um, procedure we, we used to have. We still have a bootstrap script, but it's actually not recommended to use it anymore. Um, so step one is installing EasyBuild in a temporary directory using pip. So this is how you would do that. Uh, pip install prefix and make some changes to the environment. Then you can use this EasyBuild installation to install EasyBuild itself in the final place, so where you would actually want it. In this case, I'll install it in home slash EasyBuild. And you can use the install latest EB release command line option for the EB command. So EasyBuild knows what the latest stable release is. Even if you use an older version, it knows about the latest 4.3.3 uh, 
Um, so it basically pulls it from GitHub what the latest um, release is. And then when that's done, you have an easy build module that you can load and start using easy build. I will show this hands on as well. Um, like this, I'll make this. Uh, yeah, like this, okay. So I'll use half terminal, half uh, website here. So there's three options. You can just install easy build with pip. It's a standard Python package um, without too much um, special things. Um, you need Python 2.7 or 3.5 or a more recent the three version, Linux or Mac OS at least to install and play around with it. But for any serious use, use, um, use Linux and an environment modules tool. So Elmot is recommended. So we'll, we'll make sure we have all of that here. I'll check on Python 3. This looks good. I'll check on the module command, which should tell me it's uh, the Lua based implementation. So this is Elmot. Um, easy build is compatible with a range of different versions. This is version seven, which is relatively old, but that's absolutely fine. Easy build will be happy with that. Um, so that's in short. Yeah, Linux, no surprise there. Python, you can check with Python minus V or Python three minus V like I did. And the environment modules tool, you can check with the module version command, which ones you have. If it says Lua, you have the Elmot implementation. If it says something else, you have a Tickle implementation and then you will need to configure EasyBuild to use it. Um, so by default, it expects Elmot. Um, and how to configure it, we will briefly cover that in the next um, part, um, the configuration part, but it's explained in detail um, in the documentation. So easy build is a standard Python package that's good, but if you've seen this XKCD um, <clears throat> comic, then uh, you know it can be a bit of a mess as well. Um, so that's why uh, here in the tutorial, it's thoroughly documented that there's different options and what the pros and cons are, are of those options. Um, the, something that complicates things a little bit is that easy build is broken up into three components, framework, easy blocks, easy configs. That's done like that in GitHub. It also reflects in how it's packaged in as a Python package. The easy build Python package actually just pulls in the other three. So if you pip install easy build, you will see it pulls in framework, easy blocks, easy configs. Um, so that's a little bit special, I guess. And there's not a lot of Python packages that do that. Um, and that may be something that we could change going forward, but we don't see too many problems uh, with this. Python 2 or Python 3, yeah, use Python 3 whenever you have the option. Um, by default, easy build will look for the Python command to run. In this case, uh, the Python command is actually Python 2. So we have to be a little bit careful. If we install easy build with Python 3, we'll also have to tell it to use Python 3. So the eb command itself is a shell wrapper and just looks at a, a range or a selection of different uh, Python commands. It will consider Python the Python command, the default Python command, before it looks at Python 3. And that's actually so, sort of a bug that we should fix in the EB command, uh, but you can control which version, which Python command it uses by setting the EB Python environment variable. And that's exactly what we will do here as well. So I will show this with doing all three and just cleaning up again after doing one of them. I'll do the pip one first, then I'll do the development setup. Um, I'll clean up both because the I would say the recommended setup um, is the second one. So having installing easy build with easy build and that way getting your first um, module that you install with easy build or easy build itself. So to use pip, there's again different options. So if you do pip install easy build, it depends a bit on <clears throat> what kind of rights your user has. It may do a system wide installation by default if you have the, the necessary rights. Or if you want to use a system-wide installation, you may have to do sudo pip install. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing that, but it's, it's up to you. Um, if you want to just do an installation in your home directory, you can do pip install user. And that's the one I'll show here. Um, so just to be clear, there's no eb right now, and I don't even have a dot. Oh, I do have a dot local directory. Okay, I'll clean that up. I don't really care what's in here. Um, if you do pip install dash dash user easy build. Um, pip will do an, an installation in your home directory. And here, I think the pip command is not even there. Let me check on that first. Yeah, 
pip is not there, but pip3 is there. So that will make sure we do the installation for Python 3. So you'll see it pulls in the easy build package and then it pulls in framework, easy blocks, easy configs, especially the last one has quite a bit of files. Um, so if you're doing this in a shared home file system, it may take a little bit for it to put all those files in place. Um, depending on how you do the installation, so sudo pip, pip install user or pip install prefix, um, you'll also have to change some things in the environment. So only if you do a system-wide installation, uh, the eb command will be there straight away. If you do a user installation, um, you may have to uh, update your path to include .local, home.local slash bin. If you do it in an entirely custom prefix, you'll have to update both Python path and path to uh, get both the eb command and the Python packages behind it. So even though the installation is now complete, okay, .local bin is already in my path. And if it's a home installation, Python should just find it. It doesn't in this case, because we, we've installed um, EasyBuild with pip3. So we have to tell EasyBuild to also use Python 3 uh, as the command to run EasyBuild and then it works. This is sort of a bug. We can actually fix that in the eb command itself. Um, but that's maybe also a good example if you run into this what the actual problem may be. So the eb command itself was found here, but not the Python packages that are needed to run easy build. So this is something uh, to be aware of. Um, this is well explained here. Pip versus pip3, what's the difference? You can actually, if you want to make very sure that you're using the right Python version, you can do Python minus m pip. Um, so running pip as a Python module rather than as a command, and then you have full control over which Python version is used. So that's another option. Uh, you may have to update path or Python path to make sure everything is found. And if you are using um, a Python command that's different from the standard Python command, you have to tell EasyBuild currently uh, which, py which Python command to use. This could be Python 3, or it could be a more specific version like Python 3.6. And to check on the installation, you can use the eb version. Or to get some more information about what the eb command is considering in terms of Python um, commands, you can do eb verbose equals one dash dash version. And it will tell you, OK, the first one I'll consider is Python 3, because that was um, what eb Python uh, specifies in the environment variable. And this is Python 3.6, and then uh, this is the location. So it gives you some details. If you unset EB Python and do this again, you will see it's considering Python, which is Python 2.7, and then uh, it yeah it fails to find the Python packages because it's uh, there's a mismatch between Python 2 and Python 3. I'll clean this up again. So I'll just throw away .local where the actual installation was done. Um, and I'll show you another method of installing EasyBuild. So I'll skip to method three. I'll get back to method two. Um, if you're interested in developing EasyBuild or making changes to it, um, an interesting way of installing it is just by cloning the different Git repositories. So I'll do this here in an in EasyBuild subdirectory. I'll clone the three repositories from GitHub in this directory. Um, so there's a lot of history here, so it, this, this takes a while. And again, the easy configs repository includes quite a bit of files. Um, so this may take a little while uh, to get all that in place. And then what you do after cloning the repositories is you update path. You just add the location to the framework repository into path because that's where the eb command is provided, a small shell script. And to Python path, you add all three framework, easy blocks, easy configs. The framework and the easy blocks one is for the Python modules that are provided there. The easy configs one is because easy build will look for easy config files based on Python path. That's one of the default things it does. So it makes sense to also add that um, to your Python path variable. And again, here, because we want to use Python 3, um, we set EB Python. In this case, it's actually not needed. Uh, because there's nothing specific in here for Python 2 or Python 3. It would just work without doing that as well. So after cloning, we can copy paste the environment changes. If we do which eb 
it finds it in the cloned uh, easy build framework. If we do EB dash version, it will print out the version. And now we're getting the development version of easy build. So not the latest stable release, but the ongoing development version that will become the next uh, release. So everything is now coming from here. Um, and we can start, we can jump into here um, and make changes and everything that we change here will immediately be picked up by the installation we are using. So if you're planning to make changes and play around with things, um, that's a good way of getting uh, getting started. You just clone the repository, set up your environment and you're good to go. I'll clean this up again to show method two. So lots of IO going on now to clean up all those files. Um, method two is the one I also recommend in the slides. So this is the three-step process, a, a bootstrap process where we eventually want to install easy build with easy build and get an easy build module to load. Step one is uh, using pip like we did in method one. Um, we do a pip install into a temporary directory. So we do dash dash prefix from to some temporary directory. Here I'm doing Python 3 minus mpip, but pip3 would do the exact same thing. And I'm using ignore installed just in case there's an easy build installation somewhere on the system. I want to tell pip, yeah, just ignore that and do as you're told and install the latest version. So I'll start with that. Um, I don't need to create a directory, I think. Pip will do that automatically. So it will again pull in um, the different Python packages. It has them cached somewhere because I did this uh, before. It will do the installation in the temporary directory. We can check what it has done. So this has a bin subdirectory where the EV command is and some other um, things that could be useful. And then in the lib directory, this is where the Python specific part is site packages, which has the framework and the easy blocks component um, in here. So both framework and easy blocks are in here. The easy config files are actually, uh, let's see where they are in the easy config files are probably just in here. Yes. So these are data files. They're not actually Python modules. So pip throws them in a separate place. So that gives us a temporary installation to actually use this. Again, we need to update our environment, uh, update path, update Python path, and set EB Python to Python 3. And then we have, if we check with which, this will be the temporary easy build installation. So of course you can also do this straight pip install dash prefix into your home directory, and then you have a working easy build. But what we want to have here is a module for easy build. So just like any other software, we want to install it as a module. Now that we have a working temporary version of easy build, we can just do the EB command. We use EB install latest EB release, which is an option um, to pull in the latest release and install a module for that. And we tell it where to go. So with dash dash prefix, we tell it um, everything you do, please do it under home um, easy build, which I cleaned up. So that should no longer be there, indeed. And if I run this, Easy Build will install the latest release of itself. You see a bit of a scary warning here. Feel free to ignore that. Um, that's because of the switch from dummy to system. Um, and because we're making sure that Easy Build 3 versions can also install Easy Build 4 versions. So that's something we need to be a little bit careful with. And this warning here, um, is because by default on Putty, um, the CC and CSX, CXX variables are defined to something probably to GCC and, and G++. Um, and whenever EasyBuild does an installation with the system tool chain, so using the system compilers, it takes control over these environment variables and sets up a minimal build environment. So EasyBuild is warning us, um, uh, in this case, it was set to ICC and EasyBuild tells us I'll set this to GCC instead. So I'm in full control over what's being used. For installing EasyBuild, it doesn't matter, but it does this always um, when using a uh, system tool chain. So this again takes a little while because of all these easy config files that are included. So there's over 10,000 files being added to the installation. 
uh, and already here you get a glimpse of the process that Easybuild takes when installing software. It will make sure it has all the source files for doing that. It sets up a build environment, starts unpacking, maybe applying patch files, repairing things in terms of loading the toolchain module, loading dependencies. In this case, there's nothing here, of course. And then doing configure build, perhaps test install stuff. So that's where all the work was done for a Python package. Um, and then some additional steps like post-processing that's fixing things like, uh, yeah, it could be empty in this case, fixing things like permissions is also done. It does a sanity check to make sure um, it actually it actually is providing a working installation. If it's happy with, happy with the sanity check, it will create a module file and then clean up after it itself and complete the installation. So what has happened now is in the easy build subdirectory, um, we have a bunch of directories. Um, so not everything in here is in the right place like we eventually want it to be to install real software, but it's good enough for uh, this uh, use case. It has created a build directory, modules directory, software directory, a sources directory. And here in EP files repo, this is an archive of easy compi files that was used to do installations. The parts that we care about are the modules directory. So in here you have a modules all with an easy build subdirectory with a modules file for easy build itself. And then the actual installation is under software. Again here, easy build, the version, and then in there you have the actual easy build installation. So that completes step two. We can actually get rid of the temporary installation now. So I'll just remove this to make sure uh, we're actually using our final easy build installation right now. Easy build is not available anymore because we haven't loaded the module yet. So to lo load the module, we have to make sure the location of the module files is added to the module path. So we do a module use for that. Then with module avail, we can check that we have an easy build module and then just loading the module is sufficient to get a working easy build version. In this case, we don't have to worry about part, Python part or even EB Python um, because the easy build module will set all of that for us. So easy build is smart enough to know what it was installed with. And if it knows um, um, I was installed with Python 3, it will also set EB Python in the module file and everything will nicely work. So I would recommend installing easy build like this because then it's a software um, installation just like any other um, installation. You can just load the module um, and start using it. And also end users can load easy build and install software um, in their home directory on top of what they centrally provided and so on. Um, to verify the installation, like I showed EB dash dash version, you can run EB dash dash help, which gives you a very long um, output with all the possible configuration options that EasyBuild supports. You can run EB show config. And now we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit to show the current EasyBuild configuration, which we'll cover in the next part. And EB show system info will give you some information about the system that you're running on, which OS, which CPU, um, and also uh, some basic software like glibc version, which Python binary is used for running easy build and what exact version that is. So all of these should work once you have a working easy build installation. We'll get to the configuration in the next part. Um, a final thing is um, if you want to update easy build, depends a bit on how you installed it originally, you can do a standard Python install dash dash upgrade to easy build and it will pull in the latest version and overwrite your current easy build installation. Um, but we rec what we recommend is that people use EB install latest EB release when, whenever there's a new version of easy build and then they will get an additional module for the next uh, version of easy build. In this case, I can try using it, but it will just tell me that easy build 433 is already installed as a module. So this will not do much. It just says, okay, I found a module for this already. Um, so you're good, you have your R, you do have the latest easy build version already available. There's an exercise here. All the exercise says is just 
get it installed, pick a method. Um, and I, as mentioned in the slides, um, I recommend using method two. So doing a pip installation in temporary directory, then installing easy build with easy build and loading the module. Any questions on this before I go to configuration? If not, I'll continue. Um, also here for configuring easy build, I'll, I'll walk through this and show a couple of things. Um, the recommended way of configuring easy build for the rest of the hands-on today and also for the rest of the tutorial up to some extent is mentioned here. Um, so we'll configure easy build to just use home easy build for most stuff, except for build directories, because it's not smart to do that on um, a shared file system. You, you may run into trouble if you use it on Luster or GPFS, where there's actually lots of compilations going on. So for this, we'll use the, the temporary file system. Um, and I recommend, as I mentioned at the start to make sure you have a clean environment. So module purge to, to do a module list when you log in. Of course, now we have easy build login as well. Let me get rid of that. When you log in, you'll see there's a couple of modules loaded, for Intel compilers, Intel MKL, and then MPI. For some installations, this may actually cause trouble. Um, because I, I know for NumPy, for example, if it sees an MKL, it will prefer using that one rather than the, the open blast that we may provide through easy build, which is actually some sort of a bug because it seems like we're not in full control over, over NumPy there. So that's something to look into. Um, but I recommend purging those modules so you end up with an empty module list and then you won't run into trouble. Um, and the other one here is if you check the available modules, so we'll see the easy build module we have, but also lots of other stuff that was installed. Um, so this part seems to be installed with spec. This part seems to be installed with maybe something else, but there's a whole collection of software in here. For the most part, this will not be a problem unless there's um, an accidental match uh, with something that easy build plans to install. And I think there's a bzip. Ah, maybe it was on, on Mati rather than putty. No. Okay, not here. Um, but in some cases, you may run into surprises. So it, it's, it's actually never a good idea to, to combine modules that come from different installation tools, unless you're very careful. So I recommend doing a module unuse of the entire module part here to start with a blank slate. And then um, we do on putty have a software stack already available. So in here, there's a bunch of modules already available. So let me flip up to my own recommendations and wipe the module part and only have these. And then with module avail, you should see an output like this. So this is a small software stack already installed with easy build where the most important components are the FOSS toolchain, so GCC, OpenAPI, OpenBlast, FFTW, and um, some Python stuff on top, like SciPy bundle is NumPy, SciPy, Pandas combined, and a Python version that is controlled um, through easy build. That's mostly in place there, so you don't have to wait for one or two hours until the basic um, things are installed so you can actually play around with stuff a little bit. So you, you can definitely do that by yourself. You can probably even do that in your home directory here on, on Putty, assuming you have enough storage quota and uh, file quota, uh, which may be a problem, I think, if you're installing lots of stuff, but for the installations we are doing um, in the next section, that should be okay. So that's the recommended configuration. To clarify this a little bit, I'll walk through this as well. Um, so out of the box, easy build will work if LMOT is available as a modules tool and you don't really have to configure it for it to work, um, but you'll probably not be happy with the defaults, um, especially not um, in terms of where it will install stuff by default. So by default, it will do 
dot local slash easy built in your home directory. So this is sort of a standard, but since it's a hidden directory, it's, a, it's at, at the very least annoying to work with. And using your, your home directory for lots of software installations may not be the smartest thing to do either, depending on the system you're working on. For the hands-on today, we'll, we'll stick to that. Um, I haven't run into big issues with that um, while testing things, but you may want to reconsider that, of course. All the available configuration settings, you can query through eb-help. That will give you a list of 240 different settings with a small help message. Uh, so that, that that's probably a bit daunting at first. Um, and not everything is going to be crystal clear just from the help output. Um, but hopefully, you can find what you need there. And if not, the documentation should be able to help you. Um, I'll walk through a couple of important configuration settings first and then talk about the actual way of configuring EasyBuild. Um, so the prefix, that's the one I was using to do the uh, EasyBuild installation. By default, it's .local EasyBuild, so you probably don't want to use this. Um, but if you set the prefix option, um, you're actually controlling different locations all at once. The place where software is installed, the place for build directories, the place where sources will be downloaded to, the location of the easy configs archive, so EB files repo, um, and also also where easy build will uh, throw container recipes and container images if you're using that feature. So that's all covered by a single setting that you can define um, to have easy control over the locations. But each of these can also be set separately. So you can set prefix and then set one or two of these other ones to have more fine grained control. The install path option determines where the software and the modules go. Uh, software goes into the software subdirectory, modules go into the module subdirectory with some directories under there, and we will get to that. Uh, but you also have separate settings for to only control software and only control modules. So you can put these in, de in different uh, locations if you want to. I wouldn't recommend that. I would keep software and modules next to each other um, unless you have a very good reason to divert from that. The build path is where build directories go. So build directories are where EasyBuild will unpack the sources and do the actual compilation before doing the final installation. Um, you don't want to do this on a shared file system for a number of reasons. Uh, shared file systems are typically relatively slow in terms of metadata access. That's, that's one reason. Compilation can be fairly IO intensive, so lots of small files flying around. Um, so using a shared file system may, may slow down the build quite a bit. Um, disk space is also an issue, certainly in your home directory. Um, you probably only have a couple of gigabytes of disk space and you may need tens of gigabytes for some software installations. Um, so it's recommended to change this. Um, and the recommended configuration here, we're changing this to slash temp slash user to use a local file system and have a unique path for our build directory. So we're not stepping on each other's toes. Um, you could also, also consider using devshmem, so the, the RAM disk um, path for this and probably even a unique directory in there. That can help a lot with speeding up the build process, but in some cases you will run into problems as well. Space limitations is one issue or depending on how devshmem is mounted, um, if it's mounted with the no exec option, so that doesn't allow any binaries to live there or to be executable from there, um, then you will you may run into trouble as well, depending on what you're installing. The source path is well, where EasyBuild installs sources into. Um, so whenever it downloads something, it will put it in the source path so it doesn't have to download it again. Um, this can have multiple locations, so not a single directory, but a colon separated list of paths. Um, and then the first directory is where EasyBuild will store new downloads. The other directories, it will only have read, it will only do read only checks in there to see if something is already available. So if you have a shared cache of downloaded files, you can add that as an additional path um, to the source path. EasyConfig archive is a small, uh, well, small directory, it could become big over time, but this is where EasyBuild keeps a copy of the easy config files that were used for installations for easy reference. This can be a regular directory, but you can also 
configure it to do use a Git repository and do Git commits and and also pushes um, into a GitHub repository, for example. And uh, this is well covered in the documentation. The modules tool and module syntax is only relevant if you're not using LMOD. So by default, EasyBuild assumes you're using LMOD as a modules tool, then using Lua as the module syntax. If you want to divert from that, you can use the modules tool configuration option to control uh, something else than LMOD, and you can check which tools are supported by um, EasyBuild. If you want to change the syntax for module files, if you're a big fan of Tickle for whatever reason, you can switch to the Tickle module syntax through that configuration setting. Unless you have strong feelings about this, I would just recommend uh, keeping it to the default, especially since Putty is the modules tool on, uh, since LMOD is the modules tool on Putty. Then things beyond where stuff goes and, and what modules tool is used. The robot search path um, is where EasyBuild will look for easy config files. Um, by default, it will be aware of where the easy config files that are included with EasyBuild itself live. So it does that through the Python path environment variable, but you can give it additional locations to uh, search in. There's actually two configuration settings here, robot and robot paths. Um, there's a, they pretty much do the same thing in terms of locating easy config files. But if you use the robot option, you will also enable dependency resolution, which you won't do by just using robot paths. That's a small distinction um, that's important, and we will get back to that. So only when you use the dash dash robot command line option, um, you're telling EasyBuild if there's any missing dependencies, please install those as well, rather than only the software I'm telling you to install. The module naming scheme, we'll get back to that in the advanced part. So by default, EasyBuild uses a default naming scheme, which closely matches the names of the easy config files. So it will use this name slash version dash toolchain and perhaps with an additional label attached that is controlled by the version suffix easy config parameter. Uh, and this toolchain part may be empty um, when, it, when it's using the system toolchain. So for installing EasyBuild itself, you just get easy build slash version because the system tool chain um, uh, makes this part empty. I will get back to this extensively when covering model naming schemes uh, and all the flexibility easy build gives you there. So that's the most important configuration options you should be aware of. Um, to actually configure easy build now, you can do this in three different ways. You can create a configuration file or multiple ones a user level or system level configuration file. You can define easy build underscore environment variables, or you can use command line options to the EB command. There's a hierarchy between these. So command line options always win. Um, environment variables win over configuration files and configuration files only tweak the, the default configuration. So um, depending on what you're doing, it may make sense to configure easy build in different places. That's what this explains um, in detail, but I don't think that's very surprising. Um, configuration files are use the standard ini format. So pretty much key equals value type of stuff. And to get a good start, you can use the ebconfig help command if you actually have easy build loaded, of course. Uh, did I clean this up a bit too much? Okay, apparently I did. So if you just load the easy build module, you won't have that problem. Uh, Good question. Bit, is, bit too is, there a bash, yes. is there a bash completion module for the for the options? Bash completion? Yes. There is. There's something that we include with the EasyBuild installation. I think it's in the bin folder. Um, I don't know if we have good documentation on that, but it should work. Um, so I, I think you need to source the script that comes with EasyBuild, and then you have you should have a, a completion. And the path is under dot local slash EasyBuild slash something or slash bin. So it's next to the EB command, I think, the script that you need to source. 
So in the typically in this in the slash bin subfolder. Okay. If easy build is in a module, you can also use EB root easy build to get quick access. Yeah. So but for every module that easy build installs, it sets an EB root name of software environment variable to get quick access to the uh, root directory of the installation. Um, to get back to the configuration files, if you use EB dash dash config help, it will produce a long list with all the possible configuration options. Uh, let me find one that makes sense. A prefix. Yeah, so here everything is commented out. So this will all of this will be inactive, but it gives you the right syntax to say, okay, prefix should be slash apps or whatever. So you can use this as a starting point for creating a configuration file. You don't have to figure it out manually. Um, an important distinction here, easy build configuration files and easy config files are two entirely different things. And we, we, do, we see some confusion around that. Yeah, not surprising, I guess, because the names are so close. Um, but an easy build configuration file is the way you configure easy build in a general sense, where the software go, which modules tool should it use, things like this. And usually the file names are .cfg for config. An easy build con an easy config file is an .eb file usually that specifies the details for a particular software installation. So not where that software installation goes, but what easy build should install, which version, which dependencies, which tool chain, and so on. So that's an important distinction to make. Then the second level of configuration is the easy build environment variables. So every easy build underscore environment variable will be picked up by easy build and it will try to match it to a configuration setting. If you make a typo in the name of the environment variable, easy build will complain and say, I don't know what this is. You probably made a typo or you're using a wrong version of easy build that doesn't know about this yet, um, something like this. So it, it, it won't silently ignore uh, wrong uh, easy build underscore environment variables. The mapping from the name of the configuration option as it appears in dash dash help to the name of the environment variable is done by changing all the dashes to an underscore and making everything uppercase and then prefixing it with easy build underscore. So module dash syntax, the corresponding environment variable is easy build underscore module underscore syntax, everything uppercase. So to configure easy build to use tickle syntax, you can just set this environment variable. And again, whenever you have both an environment variable defined and something and the same setting specified in a configuration file, the environment variable wins. And then of course, on the command line, you can give all these options as well with the regular dash dash options, or sometimes there are shorthands with a single dash. Um, and this always wins. So it, uh, when, uh, even if install pad is specified through an environment variable or a configuration file, EasyBuilt will use this. Um, so no surprises here. If you want to be in full control, you can use the command line options. So lots of configuration options, three different levels. Four, if you include the default settings, um, that could be quite confusing quite fast, especially if you're using EasyBuild on different systems that is configured in different ways. Um, that may become a bit puzzling, but we have an EB show config um, option that produces the current EasyBuild active, the active EasyBuild configuration. It will always include some settings which we consider to be very important, mostly about where stuff goes and where EasyBuild will look for easy config files. So this is what you get with the default configuration, everything in .local slash EasyBuild. Um, and it also tells you where it is configured. So D is for default, C is for command line argument, E is for environment variable, F is for conf configuration file. So uh, there's a very concrete example here. Uh, we'll start off with creating an, a, a small configuration file that EasyBuild picks up on. So dot config easy build config dot cfg it picks up on, and there's a there's an option, it's mentioned in the documentation I didn't mention it here, that tells you um, which locations easy build considers um, when checking for a configuration files. So there's user user level and system level configuration files. Here we'll use it. We'll tell it to use dash 
slash apps for the prefix, uh, which controls uh, various paths. We'll also set the easy build build path environment variable to control the location of the build directories. And then when we run show config and we give, um, we specify the location where software should be installed on the command line, this is the kind of output we get. Um, so build path, it says E for environment variable. So this is controlled via this environment variable. Um, F is through the configuration file. So the prefix is slash apps and then some others are derived from that. C is for command line. So the install path was specified on the command line option here. And D is for default. So we didn't touch the, the location where easy build should look for easy config files. So in a very summarized view, you have a complete overview of the active easy build configuration and where the configuration was done. And when a, when a variable or when a setting is being read from a config, from a config file, when you have a whole bunch of config files, I presume is the the last occurrence that takes precedence, correct? Yes. So there's a certain order. Um, let me jump back to configuration files. That here, DB show default config files. So this shows you which configuration files are active, um, and the user level ones will win over the system level ones. And here, if you have a list of them, uh, the last one wins probably. I would have to check that, but yeah, there's, it's consistent. Whether it's first or last, it's consistent. And user level wins over system level. So you, oh, all right. Well, in, if in the user level I have, um, sorry, if the user level wins, and then in, if I have in the user level again a hierarchy of config files, the, I can read them. I can read them uh, kind of recursively. I suppose I can do include. So. Uh, the the most recent include resets whatever whatever the previous setting has. Yes, it, it gets over so, yeah. by the last thing. Yeah, I would have to I would have to check the exact order, but it will list them here in an order, and either the first one or the last one determines the setting. I think it's the last one. I think we read all configuration files and just process them in the order that they are found in, um, and then the last one wins. It is left to right. I recently did it. Is it okay? Yeah. It is the last one that wins. Well, I did it with minus minus config files and gave multiple config files that way. Yeah, that's it's actually in an environment variable, but it's the yeah, same yeah. thing, of course. Okay. Um, so show config. Yeah, and there's a small exercise here uh, that basically tells you to configure easy build mostly in the way that is recommended in the in the slides. So I actually gave away the answer here pretty much. Um, so there's not a lot of um, exercising to do here, but yeah, you, you, I think it's clear how much flexibility you get. So I'll just make sure before I continue, because what I did in the example is actually not fully what I want. I don't want to play in slash apps since I don't have write access to that. So I'll throw away the configuration file and I'll set the prefix through the environment variable. So like I showed in the slides, and then if you do show config without any options, it should tell us that most stuff will be done in slash easy build in the home directory, except for the build path, which goes into slash temp. So that's actually the kind of view you want to get um, for the next part. Go back here and go to basic usage. We're running out of time a bit. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions on configuration. The prefix and the package path does not seem to show up but when using the method, the first method um, that you showed, which is the method number three. Have I missed a step? Have These I missed two? some steps here? Yeah. It, it's possible if you, if you don't specify the prefix. So to be clear, um, some things are always included here, like build path, like install path. Other things are only included when you customize them. 
So I think it doesn't okay. show prefix by default because it just says, okay, that's the default and I'm not even going to show you that if you're happy with the default. If, if you want to check every there... possible setting, you can do show full config. All right. And is there a way to, to say, okay, I see, uh, show, show me where this, where this uh, setting has been set, whether it was a, com a command line, where, where, where is the active value taken from, which file, which line number? Oh, okay. It, it, it just sh tells you on which level. So default or environment or file or command line option. It doesn't tell you in which file. That's something right. that I guess we could add um, into show config. I haven't considered that. Especially so, when, when there are multiple files. I mean, there is only a single environment. There is only a single command line. But yes, uh, when there's it's a very good point. Of, yeah, yeah. Bunch of files, then yeah. which file is this? All right, thanks. Yeah, so we don't have that now, but that could be a useful addition indeed to maybe here on the side mention the file name and then the line number or just the file name. Yeah, that could be useful. Good point. Okay, I'll walk through the example here for basic usage. Um, there's an ex exercise at the end here, actually multiple exercises that basically cover most of the things that I'll show in basic usage. Um, and the, exam the answers here are in the green box. So if you click this, you'll see the answer. Um, so to make it fun for yourself, don't click the box until you've tried it yourself. Um, and the exercises are different from the example I give. So you have to at least think a little bit. It's not very difficult, I think. But... So I'll, I'll walk you through some examples. Important here when doing this one is that these, this software stack is picked up. So if you check module avail, that EasyBuild is aware of these modules and that will prevent it from reinstalling uh, everything here. So EasyBuild doesn't care where modules live. If it can see them through module avail, it's happy. So you can combine things from different places very easily. Centrally installed software, home directory, temporary directory, you can combine all of these and as long as EasyBuild can load the module, um, it's happy. So the, the yeah. way you, why is it, yeah. Why is it that the being on, on login one, uh, module avail gives me a, you know, three pages worth of worth, worth of stuff and when, and you are showing just one page. That's, that's because that, you didn't clean the, the module part. I didn't clean but it, all right. If you do a fresh login, you'll see this. Yeah. And that's because the module part here includes all these directories. Okay. If you just do module unuse module part and don't make any typos, yeah, it will unload the modules as well, but then module avail will be empty. And if you do module use our part, that's when you get only this view. Yeah, got it, thanks. So make sure at the very least that you have these visible. That's probably enough. You don't probably need to clean everything else, but these should be first in module path and the module use command will do that for you. So the basic usage of easy build is you use the EB command and you give it, uh, you tell it what to install. There's actually different ways of telling easy build what to install. The most common way is giving it either names of easy config files or paths to easy config files. Um, there's other options like that has a software name option and a software version option, but that's a bit, uh, lots of typing work and that's typically not how people um, use EB. Um, so you can path to easy config files relative or absolute. So relative to the current directory or absolute. Um, just the name of an easy config file, which could live somewhere else and easy build will go and look for it in the robot search path. Or you can also give it the path to a directory containing easy config files and then easy build will use all the easy config files in the directory. Um, there's an example here. Um, so this is the kind of structure we have. We have two easy config files here and then a directory with two easy config files and another file in it. And then the subdirectory in there that has yet another easy config file. Uh, if we run this command, we tell EasyBuild, uh, use this local easy config file, use this one, which is not in here anywhere. So EasyBuild will go hunt for that in the robot search path. 
this is an absolute path, so it will take this uh, file, and then this is directory, and it will use all the EB files in this directory, and it will ignore everything else. So it won't even try to read the .txt. That's the very basics. Um, if we just try that here with one that's included with EasyBuild, we just do EB bzip2, the full name, EasyBuild will go and find that. Um, it says, okay, I found this file here. So it, it takes the first hit um, and then it goes ahead and, and does the installation of uh, as specified by that easy config file. So this is a bzip2 1.06 with the system tool chain. Um, file names, we've briefly been over all the easy config files included with EasyBuild have a specific uh, naming scheme. That's because whenever EasyBuild needs to find an easy config file based on, for example, only name and version um, or name version toolchain, it will only look for files with the correct name. So it will not try to read and interpret every possible file it runs into. That would be way too slow. Um, if you're just listing files on the command line itself, the name doesn't matter. Even the extension doesn't matter. So if you do ebfoo, and foo is an, is an easy config file that's available in the current directory, it will just work. To search for easy config files that are available, there's a search option. I think here I'm using open foam as an example. Um, so the search option, you can ask EasyBuild which easy config files it knows about, it will consider all the paths in the robot search path. So by default, the ones included with EasyBuild, but you can extend that if you have your own stash of easy config files. Um, EB dash dash search gives you a full path answer. The minus capital S shorthand gives you a shorter option that says uh, these files are in this directory. Depending on what you're doing, it may be useful to use either of those. The search option has support for regular expressions. So you can fine grain things a bit. Um, you can say, I just want TensorFlow 241 with a 2020B tool chain. So you can do, use dot star and make sure to get a TensorFlow, an easy config file that starts with TensorFlow. The reason I'm doing that is because if you don't do that, you may also find other stuff that has TensorFlow 241 in the, in the name of the file, like this Horovod um, installation. And if you don't, uh, add a toolchain version, you may also find other files like patch files. So search also looks for uh, any, any files it hits um, in the robot search path. So that may include patch files. When you do a search, you see a line like this, found valid index. So uh, EasyBuild has support for creating file uh, search indexes. So which I think I are hidden somewhere. In here, yeah, EB path index. So this is a file um, that includes all the locations of the files included in this directory. So uh, I don't know how many are here, but well over 10,000, probably 16,000. So th this search index just speeds up the search quite a lot. It reads this file and then it trusts it um, that all these, these files are in there. We include a search index with EasyBuild itself for all the easy config files included. And you can create your own search indexes for the paths you have with additional um, easy config files. So there's a uh, create index um, option and some related ones that are covered well in the documentation. So if you notice things are slow, when EasyBuild is hunting for easy config files, the search index stuff may help you quite a lot. Inspecting easy config files. So before you install something, I already did it for bzip2, uh, but you may want to check what's in the easy config file. So we have a show EC um, that pretty, pretty much does a cat of the file, but you don't have to tell where the file is located. So the robot can locate the file first for you and just show the contents. And this is what that looks like. I won't go through all of this here. We will cover that in the next section of the tutorial, what all this means and how you can tweak it if there's something you don't like. But that may help you in getting some information about what's going on. Um, another important part is checking whether dependencies are in place for the software you want to install. 
and there's two different ways of doing that. Um, there's the regular dry run. There's another dry run mode, which we'll cover in a bit. Um, but the regular dry run, EB dash dash dry run or EB dash capital D um, gives you an overview of all the dependencies for the particular easy config file and also what's in place already. So everything marked with X is already installed. Everything that doesn't have an X is still missing. And in this case, only sound tools itself is missing. All the dependencies are already in place. If you use the dash dash dry run, you will get the same view, but with the full paths to the easy config file. So it's a bit uh, less easy to digest. Um, usually you're only interested in missing dependencies. So we have a separate option for that. Dash dash missing. In this case, it says there's 22 things required in order to have everything in place to install sample tools. There's one missing sample tools itself. Um, so that matches with the output we saw before. If you do it for H5Pi and you're using the software stack that's available uh, in the project space, you will see that there's two things still missing. So minus capital M or dash dash missing is the same thing. Then, okay, you have an, a view of what's still missing and what EasyBuild will install to get something working. That's good, but maybe you want to have a detailed view or you want to check on something before EasyBuild actually does the installation. For this, we have extended dry run. So the name is not um, perfect, let's say, uh, but we do have an EB-X for short, so that's probably more useful. Um, this will give you an overview of the full installation procedure like EasyBuild would perform it, but without it actually doing something. So it will not even uh, create any directories or try to unpack a source uh, tarball, anything like this. It just um, will report on all the commands and all the steps it would do. So if you do this for this boost example, and I'll have to pipe this through less because this will be quite a lot of output. It will run through all of the steps one by one, but it does it in a matter of seconds. So even if the installation would take hours, you get almost instant feedback of what's going on. There's a lot of text here, um, but you can see it's, it's uh, going over different steps. So the fetch step said, okay, um, this is the download URL I would use for downloading boost. And this is the file I will be looking at. It says it will be downloaded. That means it's not there yet. Uh, it's, it found a patch file. And then it's walking through all the steps, verifying checksums, doing the extracting the tarball, uh, preparing the environment, which means loading this toolchain module, loading the dependencies. And in this case, it knows what that uh, environment would look like because all the dependencies are already in place. So it can tell us the module list that it would end up with. It tells us all the environment variables it will set to control compiler commands and compiler options the configure command that will be run, the build command that will be run, which is humongous because it has all the paths expanded. And it actually does that multiple times for, I think once for, uh, this is build, this is uh, installation. I, th I think it does both shared and static libraries or something like this. So there's a reason this is being run multiple times. Um, scroll through a bit. It will tell us in the sanity check what it's going to check for. So it will expect to have this file and this file in place and this not empty directory in place. If that's missing after the installation, EasyBuild will say something's wrong here. I'm not finding what I expect to find. Um, so something went wrong. And then it also gives you an overview of um, the module file that will be created and the paths that would be changed uh, when the module file is loaded. So there's, there's a lot of information here. It's very, very dense. Uh, but if you want to look at some particular aspect of the installation, you can easily do that with eb-x um, and you will get instant feedback on that. There's a note here that's worth mentioning. This is not perfect. So it depends on how well the easy block was written. If the easy block expects to find a file or needs the output of a command before it can take the next decision on how to proceed with the installation, um, then some errors will pop up will pop up in the output of eb-x. Uh, eb-x will keep going. It will not crash, but it will say an error occurred in this part, and I'll try to continue best I can, um, but you may not get the full information you're looking for. That's uh, 
important to know. And also some parts of the easy block are dynamic. So there could be an if statement in there that says, if this file is there, then I will run, run this command. Or if it's not there, I will run another command. And eb-x is not able to show you that um, because it, it doesn't create any files. It just skips over everything. And it assumes commands run always exit code zero. And yeah, there's nothing actually going on on the file system. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, and depending on the easy block, this may be a little less useful. Um, but yeah, it can still give you a pretty good view of, of what is most likely to be going on during the installation. So that gives you a whole bunch of ways to check on stuff before anything actually happens. Um, to do an actual installation, like I showed with bzip, you do eb, you give it the name of an easy config file, easy build finds it and starts downloading sources, unpacking stuff and running commands. Um, so that's very easy. If everything is in place already, like it was for SAM tools, um, if stuff is still missing, like for this BCF tools example, there's three things still missing, two dependencies and BCF tools itself. Uh, then if you try to do the installation, so without minus M, EasyBuild will not be happy. Uh, it will do the download step and it will start preparing things, uh, but then it will notice, okay, there's modules missing for dependencies. So there's no HTS lib yet, there's no GSL yet. Um, the default behavior in EasyBuild is to not automatically install dependencies, even if they are missing, you have to ask it to uh, using the dash dash robot option. Um, the, the error message I think is very clear. It literally says missing modules for dependencies. Maybe you want to use dash dash robot um, to make sure these are in place. And if you do use dash dash robot, it will first do the dependencies, um, HTS lib in this, is, in this case, and then GSL, and then it will proceed to uh, the actual software you care about. So if you use dash dash robot, it will do the dependencies first and then it will complete all three installations in a row. Now, it's a bit annoying here when installing GSL, let me interrupt it. Uh, when installing GSL that you're not seeing it's building, but what is actually going on? Why is this taking so long? You're a bit blind. Um, so we have a trace output. If you use dash dash trace, which we can enable with and setting the easy build trace environment option, uh, environment variable as well, um, you will get a bit more information. So now things are scrolling a bit faster, but when running the configure step, at least now it tells you, I run this config.guess small script, then I run this configure command and I give it these options. And now I'm running this build command and it's using all the cores. So that's easy build by default uses all the cores it has access to, and you can control that if you're not happy with that. But at least you're, you're getting some more feedback and you can actually check or take a look at the output that is being generated by this command by tailing this in a separate session. Uh, so if something is taking too long or you wanna have a better view on what is actually going on while it's running, you can enable trace mode. In this case, I did it for BCF tools, but it's actually more interesting for GSL because this takes a while. And you can also see um, once it completes something, it will tell you that the command completed and how much time it took. Uh, and eventually when it gets to the sanity check, uh, it will also tell you that what it was checking for and whether it was okay or not. So if the sanity check fails and you have trace mode enabled, you can quickly see what was missing and why it wasn't happy. So here it's doing that for GSL. And then here we're close to the end. So I, I don't think I have to uh, explain this to this audience, but if you want to use installed software, uh, you of course have to load the module. Um, and at this point, you may not be sure where Easybuild is installing software. So you can check show config again and install path. This is where stuff goes. This is where you have the modules and the software directory. To get access to the software, the modules directory is what you care about. There's an all directory in here and then separate ones for different categories of software. Um, these have symlinks into the all directory. So the all is usually what you go with unless you want to break things up into different categories. Uh, that's what's being explained here. So to load these modules, we need to do a module use. 
on this. And then if we check module avail, we'll now have two sections, our own installations in the home directory and the central installations in the project directory. And these of course rely on what's available here. So the GCC installation uh, is in here. So loading this module will also load this module, which then will load other modules. So to actually get access to the software, if you do module list, I did a purge, so I don't have anything loaded. Of course, BCF tools is probably not installed system-wide, but if you load the BCF tools module, which we just installed, you can check with module list. We have BCF tools loaded, both dependencies loaded, and actually other dependencies that were already installed also loaded together with the tool chain, which includes binutils and GCC core and needs zlib for binutils, I guess. And then loading this module is enough to get access to the BCF tools command and you can get started with using this software. Uh, this tells you to clean up your environment before you do the exercises. So just run module purge, make sure you don't have anything loaded uh, to do the exercises. If, if you have modules loaded um, and you run easy build, it will at least give you a warning that says, hey, you have a bunch of easy build installed modules loaded and then you're you're running um, an installation as well that may not work out too well and it will give you a big fat warning and you can configure easy build to be more strict and even refuse to continue if it has modules loaded um, and that's actually recommended uh, to do so because pre-loading modules and then letting easy build load either the same modules or other modules next to that may affect your installation so it's not recommended to do that so that's why the module purge here is recommended before doing the exercises. And like I'm showing here, you can stack software very easily with easy builds. We've actually been doing that. Uh, we're doing our own installations in our home directory on top of what's um, installed centrally. And uh, that works perfectly well. Easy build just needs access to the module files and then it's happening. So I, I won't run through the exercises here. Maybe that's that's good to do at least by the next session. So that's in two weeks. You have quite a bit of time for that. But I think you can you can easily run through these exercises in, in I guess 20 minutes or half an hour. Um, and they just uh, cover all the things we've discussed here, searching easy configs, checking for dependencies, doing an installation, enabling robots, and getting access to the software that was installed. So everything that was covered in this part. I think that's it. That's what I had in mind. Uh, we're very close to the end of the session, but maybe we do have time for some questions, if there are any. Might be just the detail about the, again, about the bash, um, bash completion, which doesn't seem to be uh, supported by the logins of UTA. Um, the uh, there, yeah, the, you need a system package installed indeed. So if you do this, uh, for tab, yeah, there's a system package missing to support patch completion. I, I can look um, it up what it is, and I don't know by heart, but you need something in the system installed to. If, if anybody finds out, please put it into the chat. Thank you. I, I can look that up. We probably have. If you look these look up these errors in the easy build configuration uh, in the easy build github repositories you'll probably find an issue that explains what's missing any other questions so for the the next session which is planned for let me go back over yeah here. i would like to have one question yeah. Uh, sure. So uh, we do not have, I and my friend Maciek from Cypronet, we do not have the uh, PuTTY account and uh, whether it will be uh, important to join the next session to have the PuTTY uh, account on PuTTY or- Yeah, yeah. I, I, will, I will get 
I will get you the accounts. The problem is that you just joined in today. That's why I didn't have. Yeah, yeah. To. So, so, so for today it was it was quite fine yeah, because yeah, no, I we... was uh, I have been able to do it on okay. my own system. Okay. Even even I I have checked that uh, this bash compression di didn't work at uh, haven't worked at our, our system. Uh, probably due to the same uh, problem as at Putty. But uh, yep. next session will be how to manage the things that do not work, and it would be great to yeah. have an access to Putty. To, yeah. yeah uh, I, 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 Exercise. today yeah okay for, so thanks Thank for, for the so, for the next session i think we'll mostly need the same software stack as we have here now so if you have fos installed and python installed there won't be a lot more that will be needed to do the next session as well so we, okay. we keep that we keep that fairly minimal but yeah it would be easier if you have access to putty of course because there okay that's that's also where i'm testing and where i make sure that what you see on putty agrees with what is in the document okay so I think that we will we will we will sort it out with uh, Nicolino, okay? Yeah, uh, Nicola, sense. sorry. Yeah, yeah definitely. So, sorry. No, it's okay. Both ways fine. It's just okay. short. So yeah, sorry, I, I have to I have to go to another meeting right now, but sure. it was great session. Thank you very much for for okay. it because it, it 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 is very good. It was very good. So have a good afternoon. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Okay. Yeah. Next okay. next session will go a little bit deeper. So now we've just used what easy build provides out of the box but next session we'll try to write an easy config file from scratch for something new and we'll actually we have an example that that gives you an easy config file that doesn't work and that you gradually have to fix some some problems in so that's a very good exercise because it yeah it tells you or it teaches you how to do debugging how to look through log files how to how to find what's wrong and uh, I think that's a very good exercise and we'll go a little bit beyond that I'll cover the basics of implementing easy blocks but that's uh, yeah we could probably full, uh, fill a full day session of that but I'll I'll try to cover the basics and also do uh, I'll show you how to in, how to submit installations as slurm jobs which mm -hmm. I haven't tested on putty but it should work you don't need anything special for that okay Thank you. Kenneth, can, can we ask you to stay around from time to time on the chat uh, during these weeks? Uh, from sure. Time, just in case we need something, we can drop you the message there. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's also maybe good to mention. To, to do. I'm happy to hang out in the chat for a while, mm -hmm. but longer term. Yeah. Uh, where is this? Here. Longer term, I strongly recommend using the, the Slack channel. Slack, yeah. The Slack channel. Yeah. Yes. Because in, right now in, in the rocket chat, it will be mostly me and I guess Kurt as well, who is quite experienced with easy builds. Yeah. Uh, but in the Slack channel, there's 400 people and there's always yeah. somebody active. And also all the other easy build maintainers are in there. Mm. Okay. Um, That's good. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to hang out there for a while. Yeah, yeah no, just for these two weeks in case we, we play and we want to ask you something before the next uh, yeah. sessions. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Okay, I don't know. Are there other questions we want to ask or before we start? Just a suggestion, yeah. if it would be different Cray sites, we could consider just having a special channel for Cray in the Slack. Ah, that's interesting. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I'm happy some to remarks are very Cray specific, like, I mean, obviously yep. that installing GCC and so on, but in CSC, they just, CSCS, they just use the uh, GNU compiler, which comes with the Cray software development stack. Yeah. So there are yeah. a couple of differences, which for some questions may be more useful to have a separate channel. But of course, sure. only makes sense if you are not the only site who would use that channel. Mm -hmm. But you, you can set that up yourself, eh, Kurt. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to set up a Slack channel yourself. I see you have it. Probably just click the plus. I don't yeah, know yeah, yeah. That's, that's it. And then the we can, or not. I can invite the, the CSCS people in there and feel free to announce it in the general channel. There's a now a great specific channel. Uh, and then maybe uh, maybe some other maintainers will join there as well, or people who are just interested to see how things are different. Uh, I would make it an open channel sure. just so people can, can jump in. But, yeah. Okay, if there's no more questions, we're... Yeah. Thanks a lot, Kenan. Exactly uh, on time, I guess. And, yeah. and if there's something specific you would like me to cover in the future session, do let me know. Uh, because okay. especially for the advanced for part. Advanced topics, yeah. Yeah, here we do. I think we do have some time. I need to prepare all three of these pretty much. So we, we don't have um, tutorial part, tutorial stuff for this yet. 
that, well, actually, actually we do for the hierarchical module naming schemes. The other tools are other two I have to prepare, uh, but there's probably room for some additional um, stuff in here. So okay. if people want me to demo and cover something specific, feel free to let me know. Okay, definitely. We'll discuss when we can lose and, and see if we have yep. any special need. Okay. okay. And thanks a lot, guys. It was great. It was really nice. Um, Excellent. Okay, so I'll see you in two yeah. weeks from now. Okay. Yep. See you in two weeks and see you in the in the chat. In the chat, yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. bye.